When the Buddha taught breath meditation to Rahula, his son, before he gave the instructions on breath meditation, he gave Rahula some things to contemplate. And two of the contemplations were about inconstancy and not-self. Now, it may seem strange that he put these at the beginning of the meditation, because these perceptions, these contemplations, are contemplations of discernment. So the implication, of course, is that even as you're practicing concentration, you've got to apply some discernment to what you're doing, understand what you're doing. And it seems primarily that what the Buddha was focusing on was when something comes into the mind to interfere with your focus on the breath. You want to reflect on the fact that it is inconstant, that it is not self. Nothing you want to get involved with. As for the breath, and John Lee makes the point that when you're focusing on the breath, you're f pushing in the opposite direction from those reflections. In other words, you're trying to take something inconstant, which is your concentration and your mindfulness, and you're trying to make it more constant. You're trying to take something stressful, painful even sometimes. The body can be painful. And it's just the stress of holding everything together in the body. And you're trying to make it easeful. And of course, there's the stress of actually doing the concentration, developing a new skill. That takes effort. And it requires you have a mature attitude towards your goals. In other words, you are focused on getting there, but you also know that if you focus only on the goal and not on the steps toward the goal, you're never going to get there. And then finally you're taking something that's not self. I mean, the mind's tendency to just wander all over the place and bring it more under your control. When the Buddha talks about the concept of self, that's the primary marker of something that would be worthy of calling self is something that you can control. If you can't control something, how can you really say that it's you or yours? And so although we may look at the mind, it may seem to be all over the place. Part of the mind would say, OK, well, just admit that it's inconstant, stressful, and not self, and just leave it at that. But that doesn't accomplish anything. That kind of contemplation actually short-circuits the path. So you're pushing against those three characteristics or those three perceptions. You try to keep with the breath as constantly as you can. And there's kind of a feedback loop between the constancy of your focus and the pleasure that comes as a result. In other words, if you can keep your focus steady and calm, the breath tends to become more comfortable just on its own. And then as it gets more comfortable, it gets easier to stay focused. So the two qualities of being more constant and being more easeful feed each other, nourish each other. And if the mind slips off, bring it back. Don't just say, well, it's not self, and just let it wander around looking at the scenery or planning for tomorrow or thinking about yesterday. You bring it right back to the breath. And you keep bringing it back to the breath. No matter how many times it wanders off, you keep coming back. Try to make the breath easeful and be on the lookout for the next time that the mind is going to wander off. This morning I was talking to someone who was dealing with the issue of if you're just sitting there pulling the mind back, pulling the mind back, pulling the mind back, does that really count as meditation? And it's an important skill in the meditation, recognizing when you've wandered off and bringing the mind back. If you don't fight this tendency, it's going to take over. It's going to be in charge. And then what's going to happen, say, when you're sick, or you're getting older, or you're about to die? You want your mind to be as much in your control as possible. So if you can't control it now while well, you're in relatively good shape, how are you going to control it then? So you try to catch it as quickly as you can and bring it back. 
in the combination of these qualities of trying to be as constant and as easeful as you can, and exerting some control, will actually bring the mind to a state of concentration. Now, whether it happens quickly or slowly, that's not the issue, but you can be confident that if you work at it in these, these ways, you begin to get results. And as the mind gets quieter, in other words, this concentration gets more constant, you begin to see subtler things in the mind. And you can actually start seeing the mind as it's wandering off earlier, earlier and earlier and earlier steps of the process. Because what you're seeing is what the Buddha calls becoming. A little world develops in the mind and then you go into it. It's that combination of the world developing and you're going into it. That's becoming and birth. And it's driven by desire. There's lots of stages or steps in the process for these little worlds to develop. And the only way you're going to see them in a way that's really going to make a difference is if you're trying to be as still as possible. And you're creating a state of becoming with the breath. You are here. You're the meditator in charge. And you'd want to develop that sense of that identity of your being in charge as much as you can. And the world here, of course, is the world of the body, the breath throughout the body. As for other worlds outside of that, as the Buddha said, you put aside greed and distress, or you subdue greed and distress with reference to other worlds. So you can fully inhabit this one. Those other worlds, of course, will be the other becomings that come into your mind. Wanting to think about tomorrow, wanting to think about yesterday, your plans for tomorrow, your memories of last week or whatever. If you're really still and fight the tendency for the mind to just kind of drift off into these other becomings, you can see the process more easily. And you begin to see how the mind modulates from one level of becoming to another, in the same way that a piece of music might modulate from one key to another. The different keys in music tend to have certain notes in common. So you go to the common notes and suddenly you find yourself in another key. And it's the same here. One becoming will come up with an image and suddenly you will take that image and run. That's one way it happens. There's another way it happens. It's a total blank out. You're here with a breath and before you know it, you're someplace else entirely. We want to see that process carefully, and the only way to see it is to fight it. Try to catch it more and more quickly. Make the mind more and more still. Make that focus on the breath be more steady. The steadier your focus, the slighter, more subtle things you're going to see as the mind begins to move away. You finally realize that. Many times when a thought arises in the mind, it's not really a thought, it's just kind of a stirring of energy. And even before it's recognized as a thought, there's going to be that stirring. And there's actually a moment of decision when you decide what the thought is. You may think, well, what is this thought about that you're asking to see what the thought already is about? But it's actually more your decision. What do you want to think about? You've got a list of things that you're interested in, and you go. When you can see the fact that these are decisions, then you have more control over it. Otherwise, it's like you're the, the president of a company. You sit up on the top floor, you think you're making the decisions that run the company, but actually it's the middle-level management or lower-level management. They're making the decisions. And occasionally they'll send word up to you that about this or that. So you make those decisions, but other decisions are pretty much left on automatic pilot. And as I say in Thailand, many times when the middle level management sends something up, they've already they've already mixed it for you. In other words, they present it in terms that are pretty much going to force your decision in one way or another. So if you don't get the mind really clear, really still really constant in its case, you're not going to know these things for what they are. You've got a ready-mixed decision handed on to you. 
you want to get down to see what, what was mixed into it. Why were these things mixed into it? So as John Lee says, we're fighting against inconstancy, stress, and not self. Taking what's inconstant and turning it into something more constant. Taking something stressful, making it easeful. Taking something that has been out of your control and bringing it under your control, making it more self. Fighting against not self. Now, ultimately, of course, you will run up against certain limitations. There's always so much that you can make constant and easeful and self in the mind. And that's when the contemplation goes to a deeper level. But you're not going to get to that deeper level until you've fought against those three perceptions, those three characteristics. And see for yourself how really far you can get things under your control. So do what you can to get the mind interested in the breath, to make the sensation of the breathing in the body really pleasant, really easeful. Something feels gratifying, something feels interesting, attractive. Are there parts of the body that haven't been getting good breath energy? You would really like it if you gave them some. And you find that you really like it too. And there's the sense in which the breath starts taking on a taste, a flavor that it wouldn't have otherwise, especially if you're used to just doing it mechanically. If you think of more as there are different cells in the body that have breath needs, and you're here in a position where you can send the breath to the different parts of the body that need it. And they're going to especially appreciate it because they've been starved for such a long time. And that we take parts of the body that have been painful and you turn them into a sense of well-being. And because they've been starved for so long, it feels really, really good. You get pretty riveting when you find parts of the body that have been malnourished for so long and they finally do get nourished by the breath. And in this way you find that it's easier to make your gaze more constant. So it's in fighting against those characteristics of inconstancy, stress, and not self that you really learn about the mind. And you learn the limitations of what you can make constant and easeful. And the fact that you've learned these things for yourself. That's what makes these lessons go deep down inside, where they really can make a difference.